Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And today's episode is about food, food safety, and nutrition with regard to coronavirus. I am talking with my friend, Dr. Taylor Wallace. This is his fourth time on the show. He is the principal and CEO at the Think Healthy Group and an adjunct professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at George Mason University. He has a PhD in food science and nutrition from The Ohio State University. He writes a blog, he's an author, he podcasts, and he's regularly in the media, especially more recently a regular on Dr. Oz. And like I said, he's been on the show three times before, episode number 127 on Popular Diets 101, episode 107, Industry Funding, Science Communications, and Dr. Oz. And way back at episode number 46, A Researcher's Perspective and Passion for Nutrition. Dr. Taylor Wallace, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. And I think I wear the crown of uh, most appearances on the show. So that's awesome. (laughs) You do. And I could not be more excited to have you on the show because I was not planning to do an episode on coronavirus. I did a short little announcement and introduction in my last episode I wrote a very short blog post about some tips and resources for coronavirus and quarantine. I, you know, Taylor, two weeks ago, people were just thinking about stocking up their kitchen and maybe having to figure out how to kind of stay on a healthy routine with self-care, you know, getting some exercise, getting adequate sleep, and, you know, maybe also thinking about making sure they have enough prescription medication and supplies on hand. But then we started seeing some scams about immune boosting foods and supplements and started worrying about people who might be food insecure and people with chronic diseases like diabetes. And now two weeks later, we're really in the thick of it with regard to, am I going to get coronavirus from my food? How do I go to the grocery store and stay safe? The thing that really put me over the edge and, and made me reach out to you, Dr. Wallace, is because I saw this horrible YouTube video of a supposed medical doctor telling people how to unpack their groceries at home. And he just gave the most horrible advice. One was leave your groceries on the porch for a few days and then come back and get them, which is ridiculous. Uh, Animals will come and eat them and what's not eaten, the food will be spoiled. But the thing that really, really freaked me out is when he took a bag of oranges and dumped it in a sink full of detergent and said to wash the oranges for 20 seconds like you would your hands. And I'm like, okay, this is crazy talk. And I've seen a few really great, credible articles with some safe and sane advice. And I reached out to you so that we could talk about some of that today. And I know you have some expertise and some knowledge that you're going to share with regard to food safety, of course, and nutrition. So let's start by talking about coronavirus, COVID-19. It's a respiratory disease. Tell us from a scientific standpoint, what it is. I mean, we've heard all kinds of stuff in the news, but with regard to our talk today about food and nutrition. Right. So like you said, coronavirus is a respiratory virus, and that means it reproduces along the respiratory tract. So the first thing people need to understand is that there is a very minimal chance that it could be transmitted through food. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, because when you take a bite out of your apple, uh, you swallow that apple. Uh, So it goes down your esophagus and not through your respiratory tract. And the acidity of your stomach will most likely kill that virus. So again, it is a respiratory issue. So, you know, we're not too concerned about it when it comes to food. Now, here's the other good news of why food isn't really implicated in this virus. If you look at some of the data, the virus lives for about 24 hours on cardboard. It lives a maximum time of about three days on plastic and uh, stainless steel. 
it typically lives on non-porous surfaces like plastic a lot longer. So when you talk about something like an orange that can be very porous, the virus doesn't live on things like oranges. It doesn't survive very well on that. So, you know, while we always want you to wash your fruits and vegetables, and certainly there are, you know, if you don't just want to wash those fruits and vegetables or produce with plain water, there are some products out there that you can add to uh, your water to further help decrease some of those bacteria and viral loads. Uh, Really just making sure that you wash your hands constantly Mm -hmm. um, and that you wash your produce. You should be doing this anytime before you consume produce because produce is one of the top causes of foodborne illness in the U.S. because, you know, we all like to go around the grocery store and pick out that perfect apple or that perfect orange and we like to touch things and, you know, bacteria and viruses can spread very easily that way. In regards to this coronavirus, we have not seen any incidents of this virus being spread any other way besides through respiratory contact. So food's not a huge issue in this, but there are still some precautions like washing our hands that we can take to further ensure just because there's not any scientific data right now doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. Right. So to be clear, according to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and the FDA, there is currently no evidence to support transmission of COVID-19 associated with food or food packaging. But as you're saying, in theory, if the coronavirus is on a surface and it gets on our hands, you know, I've seen the reports that say it's not likely, but in theory, it could end up, you know, if you touch your face, your nose, your eyes, it could end up in your respiratory tract. But we haven't seen any connection with that yet. And before we move any farther, I just want to be as clear as crystal about what quote unquote washing your produce means. So the recommendation, all the experts are advising that food preparation should continue as normal, which means washing produce under running tap water, no added soaps or detergents. Soaps and detergents aren't made to be ingested, and this can be very harmful. And you mentioned a product that maybe it's a fruit or veggie wash. And I want to also clarify that that would be something that you would buy at a grocery store, um, not create your own. I've seen some horrible advice of putting a little bleach in water. That is very dangerous. So we don't want anybody going to these extremes when they're washing produce. Water is good enough. And then making sure you wash your hands. So we're going to touch on a lot of different things, but I, I wanted to make that clear before we go any further. Right. And, you know, it's so important, again, to wash your hands because, you know, you might pick your nose, you (laughs) might, you know, stick your fingers in your mouth. I mean, there's a number of ways that this virus could theoretically be transmitted. But, you know, right now, the number one thing to do is stay distanced from people. You know, that six foot distance is really important because when you cough or you sneeze or you're just breathing, that virus can get caught in uh, little tiny droplets and it can be transferred from person to person if you're not careful. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about nutrition and let's be clear too, there's a lot of scams out there now about how to boost your immunity with food or supplements, but there are some things we can do just to support a healthy immune system. So it'd be great to kind of draw the line between those two areas for people And then, like I said, I read some really great credible articles from like the Washington Post and WebMD that I've got some information from those I want to share. And I'll put links to everything we talk about in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com, of course. But yeah, people have questions about exactly how to do the grocery shopping safely at the store when you get home handling food packages. We can also talk about ordering takeout food. But before we get to those specifics. Let's talk a little bit more about nutrition and immunity. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to immunity, obviously having better nutrition can boost your immune system function. So just as a general good practice, not necessarily just in this time of hysteria, it's always good to ensure that we have two servings of fruit, three servings of vegetables, adequate whole grains, lean meats, and lower non-fat dairy products, right? What's really been shown is that eating right and exercising can really help boost your immune system. And that's going to be really important, particularly if you were to contract the disease, because 
uh, that gives your immune system a little bit more fuel to help your body fight off that infection. So I would say the main thing that you could do is follow our U.S. dietary guidelines. Try to eat right during this time where many of us are quarantined to our homes. The other thing that makes nutrition a little bit more relevant here, and I was just talking about this a little bit earlier, is that we're not necessarily able to be physically active while we're at home. I live in a 600-square-foot condo in Washington, D.C., And I'm really thankful because actually at Christmas, I purchased a treadmill desk. And so I walk on the treadmill a lot these days because when you can't go outside and you're confined to a small space, it's really hard to get adequate physical activity. All the gyms are closed down. Mm -hmm. And we know that physical activity really helps promote a strong immune system too. So the main things that you can do for yourself is to be physically active and to have adequate nutrition, which you should hopefully already be doing anyway. Yeah. And good sleep is important too. Right. (laughs) Always. Although, you know, I have to say I have not been sleeping as well lately and I'm, you know, the stress is not good for the immune system either. But beyond just eating healthy, trying to be active, thankfully, you know, we've been going outside and taking more walks. I'll tell you that it's no substitute for my ballet classes and my karate classes, but it's nice to get out and get some of that uh, vitamin D from the sun. But uh, beyond just trying to have a healthy lifestyle as we are quarantined, is there anything that we should be doing from a supplement standpoint? And then how do we identify those snake oil scams? Right. This is something that has also gotten me really upset. I mean, I've seen all over Twitter companies advertising essential oils to prevent you from getting uh, the virus. Please know that that does not work. And there's no science behind that. You mentioned uh, using detergent to clean your oranges. That could be harmful. You're not going to be able to find a simple solution to keep you from getting this virus. Now, when it comes to nutrition, there is a systematic review. A systematic review is a compilation of randomized control trials. Uh, There's a systematic review that reviews 25 randomized control trials And it shows that vitamin D supplementation may have some real potential benefit when it comes to preventing respiratory infections, not specific to coronavirus. So we really don't have any data to suggest that vitamin D might prevent coronavirus from uh, spreading in your respiratory system. But viruses and bacteria in general have been shown to be impacted and vitamin D seems to help minimize the spread of respiratory infections. So if you want to take a vitamin D supplement, that doesn't mean go out and take the biggest dose you can find on the grocery store. Mm -hmm. These studies show, you know, between a thousand and two thousand IU of vitamin D work for most people. Per day. And if you've had low vitamin D and maybe you're taking a 50,000 IU tablet once a week, it's probably a good idea to refrain from taking additional vitamin D because remember, it can be hormonal-like and getting too much can actually cause you know heart issues and another number of other chronic ailments. So you know if you're healthy and active and you're inside like you and I are, you know you're quarantined to your condo and you don't have a lot of exposure to sunlight, there might be some benefit to taking 1,000 or 2,000 IU of vitamin D every day. Just know that it's not you know, a cure-all. That doesn't mean you can go out and run around in the park with 100 people or go to the beach or yeah. something like that. You, know, you still have to be cautious with this virus, but it could potentially help a little bit. And we know at least that there's no harm to taking 1,000 to 2,000 IU of vitamin D every day. And for most people, it's probably helpful. Right. And I don't know the statistics, but I know that vitamin D deficiency is fairly common. Uh, You know, I'm in Chicago, so there's not a lot of sunlight here anyway. Now is not the time to call your doctor and go in and get your levels checked. But if you haven't had that done before, I, I do recommend it on your next regular visit. I've been deficient before, and I do take about, you know, this is my end of one, but I do take 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day, uh, especially during the winter when I'm not getting as much sunlight. So, And then when I've had my levels checked, I've been in the normal range. So that is definitely something to think about. Yeah. So, I mean, the other nutrition, you know, aspects of this disease 
Coronaviruses typically cause a lot of what we call inflammatory cytokines. Those are the molecules in your body that really contribute to inflammation. They cause a spike in those cytokines. And so again, consuming things like fruits and vegetables that have a number of bioactive compounds with antioxidant potential and that could help modulate some of those cytokines, that's also a good move. But outside of consuming a good diet and you know potentially vitamin D supplements, there's not really much from a nutrition perspective you can do to really prevent the onset of this virus from spreading. Just to support good health. And as you're talking, I know I say this on the show a lot, but it bears repeating, um, especially now when we're kind of stocking up on canned or frozen items. I'm stocking up on fresh as well. But if there comes a point where I just want to delay going to the grocery store, or I can't go to the grocery store, you know, I'm going to have the pantry and the freezer produce available to me. So I just really want to reiterate that those versions of produce are just as nutritious as the fresh. So it might be a little more challenging for us to eat healthy uh, when we're delaying those grocery store trips. But just rest assured that your frozen and canned and dried and juices with the fruits and vegetables are just as nutritious. So yeah, try to get those in. And from a grocery store perspective, again, because this is a respiratory virus, you want to make sure that you avoid peak hours. So I know I went to Trader Joe's the other day and they were only letting 25 people in at a time. And I think that's a very positive step because that keeps, you know, everybody somewhat distant from the other person. So avoid peak times. And then, you know, I've found curbside or delivery services are a good option Mm -hmm. because it's not likely to be transmitted through food. You're more likely to get it from going to a grocery store during peak hours and being close to another person who, you know, might have it and cough. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, the curbside and delivery services, we have Peapod here in D.C. and I use it all the time. I think it's a great option. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the delivery because that is a great option. And really, the biggest risk is being around other people. So like you said, not going at peak times, staying as far away as, you know, six feet or more from other people in the grocery store, and then not freaking out about the packaging when you bring it home. I typically use reusable bags. I am now opting for the disposable ones. I don't think there's any hard evidence either way. It just you know makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. And you can also, you know, wash those reusable bags. But then with regard to the packaging, you know, if you do feel the need to wipe packaging down with some disinfectant, I really want people to make sure that they're washing their hands after that, after they touch the packaging, before they touch the food. Because again, just like the soap and the detergents, some of these chemicals aren't meant for ingestion. They're meant for cleaning surfaces and not ending up in our mouths. So that's something that I thought was important to point out as well. So again, washing your hands. So you go to the grocery store, you come home, you wash your hands, you unpack all your groceries, you wash your hands, you go to eat, you wash your hands, you're done eating, you wash your hands. So Right. And there have been no known cases of what we call smear infections, which is where, you know, I pick up a package in a grocery store uh, and then touch my face or something like that. There have been no known smear infections currently. That doesn't mean it can't happen. But at this point, it kind of means that it's somewhat unlikely um, that smear infections are really going to be the cause of spread for this disease. And if you think about it, most grocery store products they're there for more than a day. You know, if you take cardboard, this virus only lives on cardboard for 24 hours. So, you know, let's say you're stocking up, you know, those 24 packs of Diet Coke and you go and pick one up and put it in your shopping cart and take it home with you. If somebody along the line, along the supply chain line had touched it and they had been infected, likely it's been sitting in the grocery store longer than 24 hours. So, most of the virus is probably disintegrated anyway. So smear is kind of a hard way to transmit it. Uh, But again, if you want to be more cautious, I'm more concerned about lots of people going to the grocery store and spreading it through the air more than I am through the actual food product. Right. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. One of the articles that I'll put in the show notes is things you can do at the grocery store to keep yourself safe during the coronavirus outbreak by Rachel Askenazi. And it was in insider.com. 
And Insider talked to three food safety specialists and biology experts. One in particular was Dr. Ben Chapman, professor and food safety specialist at North Carolina State University. And then there was also Tamika Sims, PhD, Director of Food Technology Communications at the International Food Information Council Foundation. And I believe it's in this article where they talk about, because Dr. Ben Chapman is actually referenced in two of these articles that I found really reassuring and very informative, talk about how the virus is there, but then there's the half-life or whatever, you probably know the correct terminology, how it loses its potency over time. And that's what we're talking about. It's one thing for it to be on the surface, but then over time it loses its... Right. The viral load decreases. And the other thing you can do, we're all out there buying processed foods right now. Remember, you know, you and I laugh all the time because yesterday processed foods were going to kill you. And today everybody has them all in their freezer and are all stocked up on them, you know, because processed foods are safe, right? Yes. So I think people need to keep that in mind when, you know, we have these fear campaigns around food additives, things like that. But getting back to the point, what I wanted to mention is that if you're heating your food, uh, that will kill the virus. Mm-hmm. So if you heat food for three minutes to 149 degrees Fahrenheit, which most microwave temperatures get much hotter than that, then the virus is essentially gone. So, you know, buying things that are microwavable or things that you can bake in the oven right now, that's a good move because, you know, the virus can't live in those high temperatures. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that all of this, you know, and again, there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot that we don't know, but there is a lot we do know from just a food safety standpoint, it's interesting that all of this comes back to those basic tenets of food safety, you know, cooking food to the proper temperature. We know that heating, you know, proper food storage, you know, heating food to a certain temperature kills bacteria, kills viruses, storing food properly, handling food properly, washing your hands, things that we should be doing anyway, cleaning those high touch surfaces, you know, like the refrigerator handle and the sink handle and the cupboard knobs and things like that. Yeah, we kind of need to step it up a little bit and be a a little bit more vigilant now. But these are things that we do every day to protect us from other, you know, just the common cold and foodborne illness and other things that can be spread through touch. Right. And I think, you know, maybe this is a good point in the show to mention, you know, risk. We've heard a lot about who's at risk. And of course, you know, older people, um, because they have a decreased immune system function are the primary individuals who end up critically ill or who die from coronaviruses. Very interestingly, uh, last night, some new statistics from Florida have shown that it might affect men more than women. But I want to make a quick point on type 2 diabetics. You had mentioned it to me before the show started, and that's one population we really haven't talked about being at increased risk. The coronavirus enters human cells through what's called an ACE2 receptor protein. So right now, all the drug research is around ACE2 receptor proteins and how to prevent that virus from entering the human cell that way. So these enzymes are in multiple tissues throughout the body, but they're heavily concentrated in the mucosal lining of the upper respiratory tract, right? So you've got a lot of ACE2 enzymes those proteins uh, in those mucosal cells. So that's why the virus, you know, is easily transmitted through the respiratory system. ACE2 is dependent on both sodium and potassium to regulate blood pressure. And we know that hypertension most of the time coincides with type 2 diabetes. We know from 175 patients in China who were critically ill that 93% of them developed what's known as hypokalemia, which is low blood potassium. So they were urinating out all the potassium in their body. So again, that would contribute to increased blood pressure and could be of increased risk to type 2 diabetics. So, and I'm not the CDC, so I don't make the guidelines, but I'm thinking to myself, if you know, my dad's type 2 diabetic, and I was telling him last night, there's no guidelines that say, you know, you are at risk. But from a biological standpoint, it makes sense. So you might just want to be even more conscious about, you know, avoiding contact with people uh, until this pandemic is over. Yeah. So in that previous intro announcement I did in my last episode, in that short little blog post I wrote, I had pulled together some information from the American Association of Diabetes Educators, which is now renamed to the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. 
and they have a ton of COVID-19 resources. I spent the better part of the weekend with my diabetes volunteer hat. I'm in several different volunteer positions as a diabetes educator, collecting that information. And like you said, people with diabetes, as far as we know, are not at greater risk for contracting COVID-19, but they are far more likely to face serious complications and even death from the disease. But again, since this is a novel virus, it's a new virus, there are some things that we just don't know yet. And anybody with, they always say the underlying condition or immunosuppressed uh, or immunocompromised could be more affected by this virus. So extra caution. Like I tell my dad, you can't take too many preventative measures, right? Right. Um, So, you know, trying to isolate yourself and abide by the CDC guidelines, whether you're younger or older or have chronic disease or not, being precautious about this stuff has no detriment. Right. So you only benefit from it. Yes. And since we're veering into this area, I just have to say, you know, do you mind sharing how old your father is? Like what generation he is? So my father is going to be 71. So he's a baby boomer. Yes, he's a baby boomer. He unfortunately has a severe Parkinson's disease, but he also has high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, which, you know, is treatable. Mm -hmm. If I could just get him to stop, you know, eating baked goods all day, he Mm -hmm. um, has a little sweet tooth that he just likes to take his insulin shot and, you know, go to town on cakes and cookies and things like that. Um, (laughs) I should probably send him your way um, (laughs) because maybe he would listen to you and not me. You know, you never listen to your kids. Oh, yeah. No, we never listen to family members. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, and that's where I was kind of going with this because, uh, and this has been an adjustment for us all. I'll admit, let's see, it was March 12th. I did go to ballet thinking, I'm going to ballet because this might be the last class I have for a long time. And we all kind of, we didn't rip this Band-Aid off all at once. Like we took it in slow increments until like, you know, Illinois shut down. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were as proactive as we could be. But I guess what I'm saying is, it took us all a while to adjust. And we're in different parts of the country, we're all kind of in different stages of this, you know, anger, denial, bargaining, if you will. But it's been interesting to see how different generations seem to be responding to this, because I don't want to throw my 80 year old mother in law under the bus, but she was the one who seemed to have the hardest time staying put, staying at home, not going out to her ballroom dance classes, not going to book club, not going to dinner. And uh, she's, she's finally, you know, realizing that she can't because we're, you know, we're in shelter in place, you know, she can't, but it's hard. It's hard. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode because it's hard enough. And then when you get people freaked out about the food they're eating and worried about, you know, we, like you said, we need to be cautious. And that's especially for the populations that are potentially more vulnerable, you know, the older, immunocompromised, underlying conditions, but all of us. And the other thing that I think a lot of people didn't realize that could be a silver lining in this is to think about that herd immunity. And if we're staying home, not just to keep our family healthy, but to avoid getting somebody else sick who could really have a hard time with this. Well, and I would also say, have a little bit of fun with this, right? I mean, you have to kind of make lemonade out of lemons here. And, you know, one of my friends, and I tried this the other night, and I've been doing it for the last three nights, and you're going to laugh at me, but when you said your ballet class, I was thinking, oh my gosh, Melissa, this is perfect for you. (laughs) So I've actually tried some stuff online where you can learn different dances. Uh, For instance, (laughs) my friend sent me this. So Shakira... I wasn't even aware of this. When Shakira did her performance on the Super Bowl this year, she introduced a genre of dance with African roots from Colombia. It's called Champeta. Hmm. And so you can go on YouTube and learn how to uh, (laughs) dance like Shakira and do the Champeta. And, you know, it's actually a great workout. And I had a lot of fun doing it. I mean, my friend's doing it. You've seen people on Vine and on Facebook, like put videos up of them dancing. And so I think this is a real opportunity to take some of these technologies that we have and make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, people are getting creative. My ballet teacher started doing live at 5pm IGTV, you know, just in her own little living room. And so I did, you know, little ballet bar with her. My karate dojo is doing live streaming classes. 
you know, I think we're still working out the kinks as far as everybody's on the bandwidth right now. Um, hopefully it won't affect my podcasting that much. But yeah, we're doing some some more digital stuff. And, you know, like I talked to my mom on the phone a lot, but now we're FaceTiming more just because we need to see each other's faces. And yeah. so, you know, it's hard. You know, I had about 20 friends last night. We all got together on Zoom and watched uh, Sister Act. Oh. Like one of those movies that I just didn't like remember how much I love that movie like Mm -hmm. you know a phenomenal movie and you know you can watch it where all 20 of you you can see their faces and people laugh and like you know they can talk during the movie and then you can tell them all to be quiet like you know and and so it's almost like being there with them and you know you get that personal interaction you see their faces technology has really taken us a long way and you know I hope people out there are using uh, it to their advantage, because I think self isolating that much can get really lonely. Yes, yes. And from a healthcare standpoint, I understand that the telehealth guidelines or the telehealth restrictions have been loosened up a bit. I know that there's a lot of mental health providers out there who are in desperate need, because these are trying times and uh, we need to stay healthy physically and mentally. One more thing I wanted to talk about is ordering takeout. I mean, We are tonight, we are doing our first order from a restaurant. We're going to support a local business. And after reading some of these articles that brought me to want to do this podcast, I thought, okay, I am comfortable with ordering takeout and I have a taste for a steak and I'm going to enjoy it. And so that is something that originally I felt, oh, no, that's that's just too risky. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much unknown. But now that I know more, and the guidelines are basically, you know, you, uh, you have the person leave the food, you don't have that face to face interaction, and it's all paid for online. And then you take the food in, you take it out of the containers and put it onto plates, and then you wash your hands, and then you eat the food. So I'll put some resources in the show notes as well with more specifics about that. But you know, I, this experience has put a whole new spin on my do more with dinner um, initiative. I've obviously been in the kitchen every day trying to have fun with it. My daughter and I made fresh pasta the other night because it's something we've been wanting to do for years. We don't use our KitchenAid very often, but for Christmas, I had asked for the fresh pasta attachments, you know, and here we are in March, haven't used them yet. So we did that, you know, we've been trying some instant pot recipes. Sometimes, you know, my husband will make eggs for dinner or sandwiches or something just to give us some variety because I'm just so tired of, you know, the same old stuff. Whereas, Pre coronavirus, I was all about keeping it simple, you know, just kind of boring, simple. Now I want to spice it up a bit. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and you know, this is, I'm really glad you brought this point up because it's something I've been really passionate about here in my local DC community. It's not necessarily a nutrition thing, but I've actually been trying to order out and support some of those small businesses because, look, the people that are affected are the service industry. I mean, if you think about waiters and waitresses, bartenders, I even bought, you know, I get a pedicure every other Friday. (laughs) Well, and I went ahead and bought five pedicures Mm -hmm. from my local nail salon because they're not working right now. They're not considered essential in DC. So they've been told to go home. They've been shut down, which means they don't get a paycheck. So you bought those, you'll use them later. Yeah. So buy gift certificates. A lot of these businesses will sell you things now and give you credit for it later. And, you know, I just really think it's important for those of us who do get a paycheck every month during this crisis to really try to help those in need who maybe don't get a paycheck. Yes. And as I had mentioned in my short blog post in the introduction to the previous episode, there are some things you can do to help the food insecure also. So I've got some really great resources in that post. So I'll link to it and like how to find your local food bank. I mean, people who maybe were food secure or slightly food insecure before could be really hurting now. So it it is important to kind of check in with neighbors, friends and family, you know, digitally and just, you know, see if anybody needs anything. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I had wondered in my head how to help people that may be homeless or that have been struggling anyway. So I'm definitely going to take a look at those uh, show notes and check that out. Yeah, I had just seen, you know, not wanting to reinvent the wheel. But as I was pulling all these resources together, I saw some really helpful information. I mean, even, even just the thought of if you have 
money that you can donate, great. When you're going to the store and you're trying not to hoard or stock up too much, maybe pick up a couple of extra things to drop off at the food bank and volunteer in person if you can, you know, with the social distancing. There's, you know, different guidelines, but, you know, maybe you can help deliver food. There's a lot of different opportunities. So definitely check out those resources. And like I said, you know, I typically try to budget myself. And so I know that I spend, you know, on a regular weekday about $50 a day, whether it's, you know, at lunch or going to happy hour or, you know, all the things that we can't do right now. And so the federal government is taking steps. But I think it's important for us as citizens and as humans, you know, to help others. So I'm trying to spend that $50 a day. I'm trying to look, you know, at things online where I can have things delivered or, you know, order things from people who might not have a paycheck right now. I think it's really important that we support those businesses because overall, it's only going to help us recover from this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we've got the health of the nation and the economy. Right that we need to support. And yeah, at this point, we don't know how much longer this is going to last. And I even saw reports today of we might need to do another round of this in the future. And, uh, you know, we just there's a lot we don't know. But what we do know is that your food is safe, especially if you handle it properly. So I really hope that this helps the listeners, you know, whether you're a healthcare professional or not, please share this information out with your loved ones. Because We really don't need people getting sick from trying not to get coronavirus and, you know, ingesting soap, detergent, bleach, or food or supplements that they think is, you know, going to make them immune to the coronavirus. You know, these are the things that we do know. So I really want to get this information out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been phenomenal. And I actually look forward to reading the show notes because you know, like I said, I've been really trying to help on a community level. And I hope uh, everybody out there listening does as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I mentioned these, but like I said, there's an article in the Washington Post by Dr. Joseph Allen. And he is an assistant professor of exposure and assessment science and director of the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard University. There's also a wonderful article by a fellow dietitian in WebMD, Her name is Sally Kazemchek. It's a very nice, concise article on how to handle food safely during the COVID-19 outbreak. There is also the article that I mentioned from insider.com by Rachel Askenazi. And then there's a really comprehensive article called Food Safety and Coronavirus, a Comprehensive Guide by J. Kenji Lopez-Alt in seriouseats.com. And this was the first article that I saw It is so comprehensive and was so reassuring. So I will link to all of those in my show notes. And if anybody else has any uh, good resources, of course, cdc.gov. I don't want to forget that. Um, We really need to look at these credible resources. And sometimes we need to maybe take a break from the news and do some social digital interactions. Learn the champetta. Learn the champetta. (laughs) It sounds like something that I really should do. Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for being on the show and having this important conversation with me. I hope this helps everybody. And as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts.